The Bob Murphy Show, episode 121. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. In this one, I'm going to be talking to my friend Michael Bolden. Now I met him... I guess it was on the Contra cruise, so he knew Tom first, and then Tom brought him into the fold. And he's just a he's a he's a fun loving guy. And so his claim to fame in our circles is he's the founder and executive director of the Tenth Amendment Center. And so we'll get into that in the interview at some point. And uh, <laughs> the rest of his bio, I'll just read this. It's funny. He says. He was raised in Milwaukee and has lived in L.A. since 1995. According to the SPLC, so that's the Southern Poverty Law Center, according to the SPLC's profile page on him, Michael, quote, is an ideologue who has spent years promoting the idea that states can nullify federal legislation they don't like, and there's a dash, the very same argument pushed by defenders of slavery and segregation, end quote. So Michael apparently was pleased that that was the SPLC's verdict on him, and so he put that in his own bio with the 10th Amendment Center. So without further ado, here is my fun conversation with the 10th Amendment Center's Michael Bolden. Michael, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. This is pretty awesome. Thanks for inviting me on, Bob. So uh, I think naturally the first question people want to know is, you know, how did you get into the saxophone? Who the heck is this guy, right? Well, you know, I heard that so song Georgia many years ago, and I'm like, man, I can just do a better job of this. <laughs> now, do, do you often get the people think? Bolton? Yeah. You, wanna, you want some history on this? Yes, I do. Okay, so when I was a teenager, I worked at multiple Targets. Mm -hmm. My first one was Target number 24 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> And I worked in the electronics department and I didn't know who Michael Bolton was, but they would always page me, Michael Bolton dial 256, Michael Bolton dial 256. And mind you, this was probably like 1988, maybe it was like 92, somewhere. It all uh -huh. blends back then. So it's been happening for a long, long time. And then of course we got office space, right? Right, right. So, um, they're stealing my style. <laughs> It's it's funny you kind of look like you're you could have been in office space. I don't I don't know. I'm so corporate. Yes, exactly. But but yet you look like you don't belong. You look <laughs> like, you know, you 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 fooled them enough to get in the door, but you know, you're playing minesweeper in the background. Um, well, no. So why don't we take a a bit as I do with yeah, I'm sure a lot of my listeners know who you are and everything and I know probably Tom has had you on his show and you would have covered this, but but hey, you know, I'm doing my show. I don't care what he did. So I uh, want to know. Who had me yeah, on the show? Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Thomas I mean, Jeff I heard him and Dave Smith the other day talking about some guy with a degree, some Bob guy. So we can do the same. Exactly. <laughs> so how did you, I mean, I know you have an interesting background. Like you're like a, we're a concert promoter or something. Uh, tell, yeah, tell us yeah, about yeah. that. Actually, so politically, I used to be a hard leftist. I was a self-proclaimed Marxist. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, what was it like the, um, what was the one with the hanging chads, that election? Uh, that was Bush versus Gore. Was that it? Uh, and yes. the Florida thing. I rem so, so you I were going around and any Republican named Chad, you would just string them up? From uh, a yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so people, everywhere I went, I remember walking into a, uh, a gas station, buying gas, and everybody, everywhere I went at the time, people were saying, oh, okay, who are you for? This guy or this guy? And my immediate response, and I partly was for shock value, I mean, for people who know me, this fits. But I would just say, oh, screw these people. I'm a Marxist. If that guy was running, that's who I would vote for. But I really, really believed in the power of the state for everything. I went to government school just like so many of, of the rest of us. And so many people, I think, even who went to private school, they still went to government school because so many of those private schools are approved. What they teach is approved by government. So mm. I went there and I learned that every solution had a 
gov- every problem had a government solution. For example, I remember the the airline bailouts in the 80s. My initial thought was like, OK, if government's bailing them out, they're technically investing. Why doesn't government just own this? That was my initial thought on everything. So wait, what was even your question? Why am I even talking about this? Well, I was How asking I get, about your background, and yeah. then I wanted you to work in the interesting thing about that you were like promoting concerts. Oh yeah, and yeah. you decided so, no, I don't want it to be interesting. I'm going to start talking politics. So <laughs> well, so uh, even you know, somewhere, I, it kind of blends. The '90s was a blur, but mm-hmm. I, my career, I've done a lot of different things. I've run e-commerce websites. I've uh, managed some businesses. I've uh, been kind of a serial entrepreneur, but the longest thing that I did before I got into the political realm and activism was I was a nightclub promoter, not necessarily mm-hmm. concerts, but I was a, a, a house music DJ and a nightclub promoter. And I was running clubs relatively mm-hmm. successfully here in Los Angeles, in the Midwest, in San Francisco. For a while, I was literally flying from city to city. So I'd be in LA Monday through Thursday. I'd fly Friday morning to Milwaukee on Sunday morning to San Francisco, Monday morning back to LA. And I did that week after week after week. And it seems kind of like a movie, but I had to stop that at some point. At first, I thought I was the coolest dude on earth. But after like six months of that, and you start waking up on a Friday morning, you're like, oh, it's Thursday. And then you're missing your flights and you're always running to LAX and things like that. And people are skimming money because it's a cash business. Uh, it just couldn't last forever. But I did that for at least a decade, if okay, not more. Okay, I, I do want to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm trying to make this this interview different. I realized I flubbed the, the opening joke. Isn't was, this already different? Well, it is. But I was thinking Kenny G. That's why I said saxophone. Oh, that's okay. And that's but why, and you just ran with it. You, you knew. You did it with Kenny G, so. Okay, th- I was wondering why was I linking those two in my mind? Okay, that's that's well, where it came from. <laughs> Kenny and I have worked closely together for years. <laughs> uh, joking aside, I took um, I took voice lessons once, and people were like, did yeah, you? only once. Yeah, it, it sounds it, Bob. Yeah, and, and the guy, he was telling me that the, because I, I used to do karaoke, like, as you know. And so he was, yeah, and and he was, you could take the karaoke out of the man. How does that go? You're right. (laughs) Take the Nashville, the guy to Nashville. Yeah. So it's, uh, and and the guy told, he said the the number one mistake people make when they do karaoke is they, they think they got to sing loud. And he was saying, no, 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 you you actually have better control when when you're speaking. And he said, so think of it when you're singing, you're just speaking, but melodically, like you're hitting notes as you speak. And he told me that Michael Bolton, so it wasn't Kenny G, it was Michael Bolton. He said, apparently he just, he almost whispers into the mic. And so that like when he would do a show, like people would know, oh yeah, you got to have it turned way up for that guy. I mean, for you yep. is what I, what that may have been saying. an accident because I'll tell you when I whisper into the mic like that, when I'm melodically speaking, yeah. it's really because I'm being romantic. <laughs> okay, good. So you're, you're a promoter and I, I do what I'm, I'm curious, like what does that mean? What does it entail? And, and, and talk about the, them skimming money and how you had to, you know, okay. Yeah. 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 This is fun. So, um, I was really into underground electronic music. Uh, uh, Living in Milwaukee, we had a lot of influence from Chicago. And a lot of people will tell you that, for example, house music really originated in Chicago. The story goes there was a warehouse party, this guy named Frankie Knuckles, who recently just passed away. And they called it, well, what's that music the guy's playing? It came out of gay black discos, basically. And I was really into that kind of music. I liked Mm -hmm. the kind of uh, alt lifestyle, underground lifestyle. And I'm like, man, I can do this myself. When I started learning to DJ and I tried getting people to book me and when they wouldn't, cause they're like, who the heck are you? We don't care about you. I had some guy at one point saying like, look, man, I think you're pretty talented, but no one's ever going to pay you to do this. You should do your own shows so you can pay yourself. And it was just kind of, and in a way that's kind of translated into the work that I do now, if we want to make that bridge. But it's basically like, if you want to get it done, don't wait for somebody else, make it happen yourself. And so I just started doing shows. And what you would do is you would approach, you would approach a venue. Uh, uh, Mm -hmm. I would approach a concert venue or a nightclub. And maybe they were really busy from Wednesday through Friday. And I would say, you know, you guys aren't even open on Tuesday. If you let me have the space, I can take the door charge and you just get the bar and you have to do no work. And so they, pe- people would start letting you use their venue. And if you really were good at marketing and promoting, which meant mm-hmm. being out seven nights a week, handing out flyers, millions and millions of them literally over time, and you fill it up and then, yeah, I just, I don't know okay, how far so, can we go into this. Okay, so and I know it's too, because yeah, I certainly am not paying you to be a guest on the show. And you're saying, look at Bob, you're 
you're doing the podcast anyway. I'll bring my yeah. people. Yeah, it'll be good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I guess somehow I got to figure out how to, I, I sell them books. That's what it is. That's kind That's of the analog it. of the beer. All right. So you're, I didn't realize that. So when you were promoting concerts and handing out flyers, it, in the beginning, it was ones where you you were the sole entertainment or you would book other acts and then you'd be in the so, back doing your. It, you, so, you, you. Yeah. So what I would do is I would book somebody that people would know. And I learned over time, kind of one out of three. So if I did something every week, let's say like I did every Tuesday, I did this uh, venue here in West Hollywood years ago. I did every Tuesday. Uh, I picked a night where there weren't a lot of other people. Uh, events going on so I could create my own niche. So people who were desperate to be out partying any night of the week, they mm -hmm. had a place to go and I provided that for them. And so what I would do is every third week I would book somebody who was really well known and then I would be the opening guy. So people would start learning what I did over time. And then over mm -hmm. time, uh, sometimes I would flip the switch on that uh, once there was an, once there was a consistent following. And I think you can actually apply that same method to really just about anything. I apply that to the Tenth Amendment Center in many ways when I do social media, too. I have things that I want people mm -hmm. to learn about, and I know that they may oh, not oh, be so, super So that's excited. why, I like, yeah, so like every third tweet is interesting. I've noticed. Is, is that what you're trying to do? You're trying no, to actually, pull every third tweet, tweet would be mainstream and boring. I got and you, the other yeah. two are supposed to be the interesting <laughs> ones. You give, yeah, you give, I kind of do that on mine too. Like I, I do course. a lot of happy feel, you know, like, oh, everyone can get along with it. Well, it's actually more my, my personal Facebook that there that's mostly, you know, like dad jokes and stuff. Cause I have high school friends on there, but, but occasionally like if I have something that, Hey, people need to know I don't this, hang out I can, with people that yeah. young, but I mean, if you really feel yeah. the need to that, you know, <laughs> one of these days I'm going to get through that algebra class and then boom. Um, <laughs> so, Okay. So that's what you are right, interested. So can, can I ask, is this, I don't know, like, like, are there name groups that you had that normal people would have heard of, or is it all the, the uh, mostly no, mostly very underground, but the, I did an event with two live crew, for example, years okay. ago, uh, you know, and it's, it was funny. I was having a conversation with a friend and I said to them once, like, you know, I actually, I'd never been to Hooters in my life. And I'm like, no, actually that's a lie. The only time I'd been to a Hooters at that point was with two live crew in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I had booked them for some gig there. They came out and performed. And then afterwards, you always want to offer to take people out. Right. Most of the time they say no. Sometimes they'll be like, yeah, let's go to some little crappy diner or something like that. And whoever it was, I forget who the names of the people were in two live crew. But one of the dudes was like, uh, yeah, there's gotta be a Hooters around here. And I'm like, I don't know. So someone figured it out. I went to Hooters. It was like a Monday night, totally empty. I'm sitting there at a table getting wings. And all of a sudden one of the servers recognizes who it was and it became a scene. And out they're of telling music people, video. that's Michael Bolden. That's Michael <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bolden. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, uh, someone came over, Kenny G walks in. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, that's probably the best thing you can say then. Like if someone says, oh, do you ever go to those, you know, restaurants? Or like, have you ever been to Hooters? And you can honestly say, I only went once and that's because two live crew made me take them they there. They insisted. Yeah, they yeah, insisted. Right. That's, that's, that's pretty good defense. But no one could really object to that. That's good. <laughs> All right. Well, so for our younger listeners, I mean, I'm, that is triggering. I remember the only thing I remember, like the, like the band in the USA and all that stuff. Remember when that happened to them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Right. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you remember enough to even just tell, I mean, cause it was funny, like that was a big deal back then. Like that's how innocent America was that like, that was the that's debate. The mid 80s. Isn't right. that the mid eighties? I was pretty young. So I was in like when they were at their prime was not when I booked them. I booked them after they were in their prime and it was kind of a comeback thing. <laughs> and one of the members wasn't even there, but it was still pretty cool to do. Right. Uh, I was in high school. That must've been like ninth or 10th grade. Again, super blur. Okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. So then. So you, you were a, a, a lot, what did you, what did you call yourself politically? Did you call yourself a leftist or did you would not have it? Well, no, I, so I was nothing. I didn't vote. I've ne actually never voted in my life still to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried once when uh, Ron Paul's first campaign, I'm like, okay, uh, Republican, that sounds disgusting, but I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So I submitted a registration. I actually mm -hmm. sent it into the secretary of state here in California with a tracking number. Cause I'm like, I don't trust these people. I was kind of <laughs> Alex Jonesy at the time. And, right. and I'm like, oh, they're going to screw me over. But then when I went in the primary and I went to vote for them, they're like, well, you're not on the roll. You can file this provisional ballot. I know they got it. 
uh, my registration. And then like three, six months later, I got a letter from the secretary of state or whoever it was that said, you're, we're sorry to say that your vote was not counted because you weren't registered. So I don't know if that happened to just me or if maybe Ron Paul actually won. <laughs> that's I mean, funny. That's a fun way to think of it. I like to think, I like to think of very positive approaches on things, but. Right. And so there the, the Alex Jones preparation came in handy. Like it did. Yes. So you got to think like that. Okay. Good. Well, that's all right. But so I was one. nowhere politically. I actually mm. hated it. And the guy who actually, so once I was done promoting, I got burned out. I literally spent two years living a cheap version of Larry David's life in Curb Your Enthusiasm. I would just sit around, hang out, talk to friends. People would pop mm -hmm. over. We'd go for a walk. Stop Richard Lewis would show up. Yeah. I mean, it was basically kind yeah. of like that. Mm -hmm. So um, my DJ friends and I, we would just hang out all the time. That's all we did. And I had enough cash on hand that I was able to live like that for like two years. And I started getting desperate. So I started doing other like odd jobs and things like that. But in the man, I don't know if it's late nineties, early two thousands, I saw a film by Michael Moore. And a lot of people find this surprising from where I come from now, but I saw this documentary by Moore called the big one. And he used to do these old school documentaries on his book tours. And I forget mm -hmm. what book this was. It was just him walking around talking to people and looking at stuff. And I remember him going, being in Times Square and it was like, they showed the two candidates up on two big screens saying like, okay, there's an election coming up and it was Clinton, maybe Bush, something like that. I don't know. And he's like, look, see, they're exactly the same. And for whatever reason, that was enough to resonate with me to be like, yeah, screw the entire system. It's all wrong. And I really started trying to learn a lot of stuff. But what I was learning was a lot of status garbage. Uh, and uh, it went a really weird way until and what really kind of transitioned for me was when the war in Iraq started. And mm -hmm. I just that was really my thing. And so I was uh, working with the communist uh, uh, answer coalition for, for a while, volunteering and going to events and helping organize. I mean, because that's my skill, promotion, marketing, things like mm -hmm. that. So it would help bring people out to these anti-war rallies. It, I think Rothbard once, I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but he said something like, the left is 90% strategy and promotion and 10% theory. Mm -hmm. And we on the right, unfortunately, are 90% theory and 10% strategy. Do you, does that ring true to you? Oh, man, that's amazing. Was that back when he was working with, like, trying to work with SDS, you think? I don't know. Democratic I mean, society. it could have been, or it could have just been him lecturing Brilliant. the, the yeah, right wing okay. people saying, guys, you know, you need to figure out how to market your ideas. Because, yeah, your ideas are better, but the left's killing I you. I will tell you what. Mm -hmm. I have more people on the right rejecting working in coalition with my organization, 10th Amendment Center, by far, knee-jerk reaction, I won't even get close to you, than we get from the left, who you would think would just think I'm some kind of racist, uh, neo-Confederate piece of garbage, right? Right. Uh, I've had meetings at ACLU. Hey, hey you're not a neo-Confederate. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Hopefully everybody gets this. Yes. So, and if not, you're not in on the game. So, uh, I mean, I, I'll be out. I've been with uh, my friend and longtime coworker, Mike Meharry. We're at ACLU headquarters in New York City, whatever their like glamour high rise building that they're in. And we're there working together to try to stop surveillance, protect privacy. And we're talking about how we can come up with a coalition and work just on that issue. And at some point you'll get an offhanded comment from like Edward Snowden's lawyer saying, well, you know, you guys are really into that pro gun and anti Obamacare stuff. Ha, ha, ha. Like they think it's funny and they try to insult us. I'm like, yeah, cool, whatever. So let's work on this. But I think the left in my experience has been far more willing to, instead of focusing on differences, focusing on common ground, building mm -hmm. coalitions. And where the right, uh, I more often get, well, I don't like uh, the fact that you support states on weed, for example, more so years ago than we hear now. Right. But I don't like that. So I'm not going to listen to you on guns or anything else. Okay. I like this and let me take it further. So uh, from a different perspective, because Paul Krugman oh. one time, you know, as, as you know, I'm, uh, I follow the man's work and uh, I have a short yeah. Says so. And he, and he, uh, he, I, I forget exactly what point he was making. He, he was, I think he was trying to explain why the, the right wing Republicans are sort of painted into a corner all the time. And he was saying, cause they're real ideological. And, and the way he put it was to say something like the democratic party 
you, you know, so in other words, they're, they're, they have to be anti-tax, blah, blah, blah. And he listed like whatever their principles were, you know, anti-science or however Krugman would ca- characterize it. And he was saying, so that's why on some of these issues, there's such, you know, such nut jobs and they ignore reality is because they already have their doctrine in place and it tells them what the answer has to be. And so then you're wondering, okay, Krugman, well, how come the, the left isn't like that? And he had an answer and he said, oh, because the Democrat party isn't like founded on an ideology of big government. So he was saying, you know, Republicans are, are reflexively anti-government and he knows in practice, they're not like with wars and right, stuff, right. but just in terms of their rhetoric they have to always be anti-government because that's their their core, their their persona. He was saying, in contrast, the Democrats are not reflexively big government, on you know, notwithstanding the you know the accusations of Rush Limbaugh. And he said because what they are is a coalition of different interest groups like teachers oh. unions. Oh yeah, blah, blah blah. So I took that when I was because I for whatever reason was responding to that article and I spun it and I said, like yeah, I agree, Krugman. The people on the right have principles <laughs> that they say you know yes. so they can be hypocrites because whereas Krugman was saying. The people in the Democratic Party, by definition, can't be hypocrites because they have no principles to define. So that's the way I. So how do you feel that, about that? That it, on the what well, you're painting is a virtue, but one could say, yeah, it's easy to coalition if you don't care about who you're working with. Well, I think uh, those of us who actually believe in liberty, we have mm-hmm. to acknowledge that we're not even close to being in a small minority. If right. we believe in liberty across the board, that's my right. view. I think right. the 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 amount of people is absolutely tiny. And then when you even get into that group, we're going to have the the debates about who's a pure libertarian, right? Like right. everybody's I evil. I think there's that six of them as of last yeah, yeah, Thursday. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> gone up lately. So that's nice. We're, we're improving. But, you know, so my thing is I actually want to get stuff done. Mm-hmm. And I recognize that if I'm only going to work with three of those six pure libertarians, because the other three are saying, do it, you know, like I'm just prepping and waiting for the economic collapse. If I want to get something done, I actually have to work with ideological opponents. And mind you, if I don't want to work with those people either, I could never go to Thanksgiving. I mean, that's never happening. Right. I mean, if we can work together in family units with people who are clearly absolutely nutcase wrong when it comes to economic and political theory and views, we can certainly do that with other people. And my thing is, man, let's say ACLU is terrible on guns and centralization of power, but if they're going to help me uh, stop some surveillance, some mass warrantless surveillance, that helps everybody. Mm -hmm. And if if the NRA is going to be terrible on the police state, but they're going to be helpful on uh, the right to keep and bear arms, they're not the best. They're, um, but yeah, that's right. another but, episode. I get what you're but saying. Let's say, yeah. let's say mm-hmm. then, then we're advancing that. And I want to be the one that brings people together. And what I've learned over time is that once in a while, this doesn't happen a lot, but once in a while, the people from the far left or the far right who really don't, I mean, we can Nolan chart it, but the people who aren't, you know, anti-authoritarian, once in a while, after you've worked with them for a while, they'll be like, you know, you've been so good on this issue, asset forfeiture, whatever it may be. Maybe what you have to say on this other issue is something worthy of listening to. And Mm. I do find that pretty regularly. Like if it was just a a kind of a side hobby, it probably wouldn't happen often. But because I do this all day, every day, it does happen pretty regularly. And I'm seeing it more and more over the years. And because it's not like a, just a hodgepodge of your pet projects or interests. Like there is a consistent yes. you know, rationale for what, what your position or what your take is on something. And yes. so I think people can see that you're consistent. Just like there are some, like I think Glenn Greenwald appreciated Ron Paul. Like he had, he had a great article yes. when Ron Paul was running saying something like a lot of us on the left keep saying, where are all the, the principal Republicans, the constitutionalists, well, here's Ron Paul and look how you guys are treating him. So, yes. you know, I don't want to read anymore about, oh, these Republicans are such hypocrites that here's a guy, you know, I disagree with him strongly. You know, Glenn Greenwald says, on, yes. you know, his views on what, whatever, welfare reform Both or things, something. Yes. But at least I get where he's coming from. And he is, you know, he's not going along with his peers when it comes to, you know, bombing Iraq or whatever. And so yep. I, I could see that. So I can see that with, with you. The, yeah, I'm sure a lot of the people from the left, let's say, or even the right that you work with, might disagree with you on X, Y, Z, but they could see, given that this is the way Bolden looks at the world, it actually makes sense that that's his position on those things. It's not just that you, your donors tell you to do one thing versus the other. Oh, no. I mean, I love people who donate, and we couldn't <laughs> do it without it, but I started this organization in 2006 mm-hmm. with the goal of reaching five people, and I worked— And you're 30- almost there. I mean— 
we're, you know, there's six libertarians. <laughs> I've hit two of them and two commies and yeah. one neocon so far. But, you know, so I, I, I pick something and I was talking with a guy, Dan Reed. I don't know if you know Dan, uh, but he so. runs the Culinary Libertarian podcast. Really, really nice guy. I've been mm -hmm. on his show. And he's asked me a number of times, like, how did you get from point A where you like, you weren't making a living off of this to where you are now? And for me, honestly, it's because I didn't try to make a living out of it. I really just wanted to do something that I loved and cared about. And mm. I just wanted to express the fact that I thought government was monstrous. And for me, it was based on war powers. Uh, mm. And it doesn't matter what political party is running things. I just wanted to put that message out there. And I think it resonates. And also, I'm kind of a workaholic and I'm a promoter. So I just right. keep doing it. Right. And when I hit that five people, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, maybe I can get 50 or 500 or 5 right. million. Yeah, so. Okay, so we've been dancing around it, and but let, let me just formally then give you a chance to explain. So how did you, how did you know you wanted to form, you know, a, a center or something, and then why the Tenth Amendment Center? Okay, cool. So uh, I knew I wanted to do something. I was uh, very much against the war in Iraq. I still am. It's still there. I'm like, uh, I just thought it was absolutely disgusting. And I'm like, I should just start a blog. And I was reading stuff. I, mind you, I also wasn't identifying as as a Marxist at that point. We're talking about early 2006 this is, or just after the war in Iraq started. Can, can I stop you for a second? Because sure, I'm sure, sure. you with me just for, you know, my disclosure to the listeners. So I was against, you know, the U.S. doing that, but I was so naive when the Bush administration was saying, hey, Saddam has these WMDs. They, need to, they need to turn them over or else you know, we're going to. I actually, you know, I was hoping it would there wouldn't be a war, but I actually thought, wow, well, I guess we'll, we'll see here if, if, if the, the way I was, I was reasoning, it was saying if the Iraqi government turns over the weapons and the Bush administration then moves the goalposts and invade, clearly it's the Bush administration is the warmonger. Mm. Whereas if Saddam doesn't turn them over, it didn't occur to me that there wouldn't be them. And not because right. I didn't think they would lie. Here's where this, I want to show you how naive it this was. Is like, interesting. Oh, because I thought, if you say another country has weapons of mass destruction, you then invade and they don't turn up, you would get in trouble somehow, I thought. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. That was the one flaw in my reasoning. Yeah, and well, so, it's a biggie. Yeah. It's a biggie. We've all had that at some point in some scenario. I probably still have that from time to time, but I'm such a cynic, though. So, yeah, I guess it was like 2006 or so. Where am I going with that? Oh, how did you come up with Center? Right. And so Harry Brown was actually really influential. And for people who don't know, he was a, a two time Libertarian Party presidential candidate, but he wasn't just some uh, some activist guy. Harry was a, a long time, well-known author. How to find freedom and unfree world is one of his best books. Also how to profit from the, uh, uh, upcoming devaluation that he wrote in the, I guess that would have been early seventies, huh? I uh, think so. when they decoupled, uh, Nixon deco ended the gold standard formally. And then he wrote like fail safe investing. He's a sound money Liberty guy. I don't think he was an ANCAP, but he probably was pretty close to it. Uh, and, I really was influenced by the, the fact that basically I was, he had a, a radio show, I guess, pre-podcast. He had a radio show at the time, and I was listening to him while I was working a customer service job. He was on late at night, and I would listen to him, and every time I heard about something, it was just so – it made so much sense. Government tells you they're going to do this. They've either lied about it or if they actually accomplish it, it costs 10 times the amount that they ever said. I'm like, man – this is awful. And he's like, oh yeah. And then all these wars that they're doing, they're all either lies or they're killing people or they really, you know, it's not, I just recognized that the entire system was a sham. So I'm like, I got to just do something. I'm like, he's doing this radio show. I'm reading articles from other people. I see all these like really crappy independent websites. I can build something too. And I was uh, pretty good at doing stuff. So I built a WordPress site and I bought three different domains, 10th Amendment Center, Fourth Amendment Center and Fifth Amendment Center. And I started blogging on all three of them. I, I don't didn't know, know that. Before. I was even, I had jokes based on that premise. Oh, uh, man, I ruined your whole skit because it's real. Yeah. So, well, the reason I got Center is because there's a uh, an organization that still exists today. They're not very prominent, but the First Amendment Center, I'm like, 
why isn't there anything other amendment center? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously people need to learn about stuff. And there was the whole Kelo decision, I think, in right. 2005. So the eminent domain and the Fifth Amendment thing kind of came into my head. And uh, spying and stuff like that started becoming more and more prominent amongst the public. And Fourth Amendment was, you know, just the right thing to do. And then I'm like, oh, the Tenth Amendment thing. And Harry Brown used to talk about the Tenth, too. And then when I started blogging on that, I recognized that technically, because it's a rule of construction, pointing out that government is only authorized to do a certain limited number of things, you could really write about anything. Uh, and so that's the one that For I For the benefit spent of the time. listeners, the Tenth Amendment Center is the one paraphrasing that says any powers not enumerated here are reserved to the states of the people? Yes. Okay. I mean, I knew it was big, that's but it. I, I want it. Yes. That's it. Powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. It's a lot of people think it's a state's rights document, but it really isn't. Uh, I mean, if you really want to get all geeky out on this, really, it's it's a uh, it's a, a reaffirmation of a sovereignty and sovereignty throughout history was always in the hands of one person, a king, a queen, a group of oligarchs. And this was recognizing that it's not power to the people. That old John Lennon phrase is popular protest phrase. That's actually backwards. It's actually supposed to be power from the people. The key is, is that people need to actually act like it. Mm hmm. Right. And, and so does that also go hand in hand, I guess, with the, with the strict construction of the Constitution? Are those similar in other words, the, the point of the 10th Amendment is the founders were afraid that if they didn't say that explicitly, people would assume unless, in other words, my understanding, and this is just, you know, basic school stuff, that part of the reason they were, some of them were reluctant to do the Bill of Rights was they were saying no, because if we start expressly saying what people's rights are, it will sound like if we miss something, Yes. Therefore, the, the federal government can do anything that we don't. And so that's what the yes. function of the 10th Amendment was. That's a great was. summary. That's why yeah. the Ninth and 10th Amendment, they actually are technically work in hand, mm -hmm. uh, hand in hand. The great concern from the founders repeatedly over and over, where you're talking even opponents like George Mason, Patrick Henry and others, the great concern was what they called consolidation. They were concerned about centralization of power. And even though they were creating a government that had more power than under the Articles of Confederation, the opposition wasn't really just to doing more power, but concerned about uh, vagueness or not having a Bill of Rights that really hammered home. Like in Virginia specifically, they wanted what became the 10th Amendment when they ratified the Constitution. They actually wanted that in the body of the document. Right. So it was really, really clear that if it wasn't delegated to them, they can't touch it. Now, mind you, no matter how good of a document you write, words on paper don't enforce themselves. We've mm -hmm. all read human action. You'd probably be much more, uh, uh, much better understanding that than I, but we know that it really is a, to me, I would say it's a market response. No matter how good a document is, if the people through their market actions demand more and more big government, more socialist programs and things like that, that's what's going to happen. Those are the people they're going to vote for. Those are the things, those are the programs they're going to be cool with, that they're going to demand. And it doesn't matter what's on paper at that mm -hmm. point. So I think really what we're facing, to, in fact, James Madison in Federalist 48, this is when he was arguing in favor of ratification. It wasn't broadly read at the time. This was primarily to a New York audience because New York under Governor George Clinton, if we want to talk music again, uh, they were very much anti-federalist or opposed to ratification. And Madison, Hamilton and Jay were actually trying to convince them to ratify because that would have been a big problem. In Federalist 48, he made the point, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, look, even the best constitution is still a mere parchment barrier. The founders recognized that parchment barriers don't stop government. And I think in modern times, we could just say it's the market. So if the market hates liberty, we've got a big problem. That's why I think education, podcasts, books, and all that are so important. But we also have to show how to do things in practice. Right. So as you know, Michael, I was supposed to go, you know, when Tom had his, and Tom Woods, had his, was it his thousandth episode or 500th? I forget. The one he had in Florida, we had the big, the big Thousand. bash, thousandth. I was supposed to go and then there was like a hurricane or something and I couldn't make the, the makeup date. I was working on it. And so folks, there was going to be a roast. And so Michael was going to be there. Tom was going to be. And so one of my jokes was going to be along the lines of Tom author of who killed the constitution. And then Michael relying on the constitution to protect our liberties. You, you see the, the premise there. That's and so, funny. and since you full, well, fully well know that, Oh, the federal government is the bay the con. So, Again, just you know, just to give you a chance to. Am I killing your jokes? Well, I think I'm killing them too. They're they were oh, stillborn. Well, so you're killing. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm dropping well, bombs. I think, I, yeah. So I understand the Spooner argument. The Spooner, right. Lysander Spooner, who actually, I mean, most people who cite Sooner, Spooner haven't really read Spooner. Mm -hmm. uh, Spooner wrote for years on constitutional arguments on the post office, the Fugitive Slave Act, things like that, constitutionality of slavery. So he didn't actually reject the idea of making constitutional arguments, but he came to a conclusion that he said, look around us. You've got this horrible situation. People are in bondage. Mm -hmm. Either the Constitution has authorized this or it has failed to prevent it. And I think that makes a lot of sense to people. I think primarily we hear that in the ANCAP world. But I think it's based on a faulty assumption that words on paper can actually cause or prevent anything. I don't think they can. I think it really is a market response. And if I ran uh, a small chain of stores and I didn't want to actually run them, let's say I own them and I delegated power to a manager and they just did, did stuff differently, is it the rules that I gave them? Or is it the fact that I didn't enforce that caused the problem? Is it my hiring practices? Or if I was okay with it, then it's really me being okay with it. And maybe that's not the best analogy because it's not the same as hiring people when you're talking about government. But certainly the Constitution itself, you can't just wave a paper at somebody and say, see, this is what it says. And uh, people who actually expect that to happen, I think, uh, have very much been a part of the problem. Sure. So, so let me just try what – so you, you wanted to do something the, like the Iraq war was a part of the impetus. Yes. But I guess if I'm getting it, why did why not do you know uh, anti-empire.com or the the anti anti-imperialist center? Like, why did you pick an amendment to be the the funnel through which you ran everything? Well, it, I was actually just so. For example, again, back to First Amendment Center. I'm like, well, that's actually a really good idea. There's a lot of Second Amendment organizations, mm -hmm. but with this whole Kilo Supreme Court decision, eminent domain is a problem. I'm like. Right. You know, I'll talk about that. I'll talk about surveillance. And I recognized even back then that if you could if you could talk about a specific topic, you'd be more successful than doing things broadly. And I did want to talk constitutional issues and mm -hmm. not just on war. I recognized that uh, antiwar.com was already pretty prominent. There was a lot of people talking about war at that point. But I wanted to also be able to talk about war the Patriot Act, the Real ID Act, the drug mm -hmm. war, things like that. And where it just was easiest to fit and where people actually paid the most attention was on the 10th Amendment Center. I mean, I kind of wish I still had fourth and fifth, but I uh, just don't have the hours in okay, the day. So, so what happened there? Like you were giving them equal attention and then for whatever reason, the 10th Amendment just started going up and so you, you Getting more on attention, that? yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like um, when I, I did this debate or I, I did the debate, I tried to get a debate against Paul Krugman and so I yes. had this thing called the point, which was like a way that yes. people could pledge. I that too. Oh, good, yeah. And then I don't, so I don't know if you know, but eventually, partly why that collapsed. Like I, I got folks just you know I got over a hundred thousand dollars in pledges. And the, the way this I thing worked, I saw you flexing in mirrors, Bob. Oh, that geez. was one of the most awesome point campaigns ever. Actually, I'm going to link to that just in case I got some new That's listeners who don't even awesome. know what we're talking about. It's, this is uh, so cool. Yeah, it's it's good stuff, folks. Um, but. The, the, so the way it worked is I wouldn't take their money. Like a threshold, you know, the, the criterion had to be hit before your credit card would get dinged. So that was like the yep. low risk thing. So we were trying to raise money to, it was going to go to a food bank in New York city. If Krugman debated me on Austrian business cycle theory. And, um, but anyway, but the, the entity that organized that or two was called the point. I think it was the point.com. Yeah. The point. Yeah. And then at some point though, years after I had set up that campaign, they kind of went away. And the reason was, one of their offshoots was Groupon. Oh, and so they, I didn't know and, that. And, and since that was real profitable, whereas the thing, the point, I think they just got like some small token, you know, percentage Same or concept something. concept for me. Right. You and start, so, yeah. You start a project and I was kind of a serial entrepreneur. I had an mm -hmm. online electronics e-commerce store. I had uh, been a manager at another uh, e-commerce. So I've done a lot of e-commerce business as mm -hmm. well uh, and whatever just worked. And well, I also kind of like, I was also working part-time jobs while I was doing this. And I think there was also something to be said for the fact that because it was getting more attention at 10th Amendment Center and I could write about more stuff more often, it was just more fun. It was more mm -hmm. enjoyable to me. Yeah. Okay. So you got the 10th Amendment Center going. So maybe give us some, uh, why don't we do the real fun one first? And then, nice. you know, then we can do the other one. So my, the favorite thing I've, I've heard that, that you did 
is you're, you're trying to come up with ways. So, so again, the, the idea being the feds are doing all this crazy stuff. It's unconstitutional. You're, you know, pointing that out to people. And, and by the way, we should mention, there are plenty of Americans who think the constitution is a valid binding document. And so that's partly the, the cachet of just pointing out, okay, well, here's what it says. Clearly they're violating it. You know, that's just a way to try to appeal to people. Like they yeah, Woods actually made a great art mm -hmm. a point in an old article on war powers. He's like, look, just pointing this out isn't going to change things, but it's an educational tool to show how far off the rails these people are. So let's say you don't like the Constitution. Let's say you take the Spooner view. I think it still can be a very powerful educational tool mm -hmm. for the general public. I just want to just kind of reaffirm. Yeah, what and you because they all swear to uphold it. So it's, oh, yeah. it's sort of like, you know, if you pointed out that the in the Soviet Union, the ruling class clearly had a higher standard of living than the, you know, the workers it would be worth pointing out, you know, not that you, a libertarian type holds up inequality is a bad thing, but it's like, look at what their official doctrine is and how they're, you know, this the point of the their Soviets hypocrisy. had a constitution. Oh, you should, you should start blogging for them too. Then. I really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The so the, the one I like the, is, is with the NSA. And so yep. tell the folk, like, what was your, your, your plan for how you were going to limit the, the oh, NSA? Man. It's, it's, so I think everyone really, had the idea of NSA spying become so prominent because of Edward Snowden. Right. And so that was what, mid, early 2013. This is Glenn Greenwald, et cetera, mm -hmm. releasing these documents, Laura Poitras, I think. And a lot of people started hitting me up that year saying like, or shortly after this, like, hey man, you've been working on all this nullification stuff, trying to stop federal programs. What are you going to do about this NSA spying? What can we do? I had a lot of people reaching out to me, people I hadn't heard from for a number of years at the time, friends, non-supporters, over and over and over. And everybody who asked, I'm like, nothing. What can you do about it? Nothing. I don't know. That's not, that's, what can you do from a state level to deal with NSA spying? They're tapping in uh, to phones and things like that. It's impossible. At some point, I just started kind of reading and researching and I came across this article from 2006. <laughs> can I, just, I just like the way you're telling the story. You're like, I said, there's nothing we can do. And then I decided, you know, I'm going to read on this. And then, <laughs> is that and, funny? Yeah, because yeah. I don't know. It's really like, <laughs> well, there's so many people asking. I'm like, all right, I'll look at it. And then I'll tell them I looked into it and definitely not. Yeah. There's no way. After further review, the play stands. Yeah. And so I found this article. I don't know how. Uh, 2006, Baltimore Sun reported that Fort Meade, Maryland, NSA headquarters, had maxed out the Baltimore area power grid, literally to the max. They said at minimum, it would cause rolling blackouts, not only to the city, but to the NSA. But at maximum, they were concerned about what was called a, quote, virtual shutdown of the agency. So I'm like, oh, okay. So there's actually a physical limit mm -hmm. on what they can do. And then I started doing some more digging and I found out that right after that or right around that time, probably before that as well, they started searching out for more locations. They were like, man, we, we can only do so much here based on the mm -hmm. technology we have. So they started expanding to other locations. And when we talk about the NSA data center in Bluffdale, Utah, for example, this at the time was the large, when they first opened it up, was the largest facility in the world for the NSA. Mm -hmm. They needed to go to other places. NSA, Bluffdale, San Antonio, the Texas Cryptologic Center built in an old Sony factory after that time. The reason that they picked these locations in Texas, A, because it has an independent power grid and they got a deal, sweet deal through a, a state run or a public private partnership type of thing, uh, a deal on electric costs. So mm -hmm. they could go there. And if Baltimore maxed out, they're still running over in Texas. And in Utah, they got a sweet deal in the desert on water prices because in these large data centers, they're, they pour water over the top of these rows and rows of computers. They're water cooled. And in Utah, they were saying originally that they needed as much as 1.7 million gallons of, waters a day, of water a day. That was revised down. There's some minutes from the Bluffdale City Council. It was revised down to 1.2 million. And I know that through all the strategy and the approaches that I use on other issues, that when the federal government runs a program, the states don't actually have to participate in it. This has been a kind of a longstanding thing. We've seen this happen in marijuana, for example. And I thought, well, why not? This is really an Achilles Hang on, let me, like with the marijuana, so like if the DEA comes in, you're saying like the local sheriffs and stuff, 
they can't really impede them. Otherwise, that's kind of an issue. But they could just stand back and say, well, we're not sending our deputies to the house to arrest them. Like, you can do what you yeah. want. But is that I mean, kind I, of what you mean? I have a kind of a John Wayne fantasy somewhere in the back of my head where that local sheriff is going to be like, right. yeah, I will impede you. But that really is not a, a very good strategy in the status quo. Uh, so technically, under the, the law as it is now, no, they couldn't do that. And they really don't. And you can't rely on them to do stuff like that. But yes, they can just not participate. And we recognize whether it comes to to uh, marijuana or guns. And I think I talk about guns pretty often in this way. That the ATF has only around 5,300 employees for the entire country. A third of them are in administration. So they have what my math is terrible. I went to government school, like what, 3,500 or so uh, enforcement agents. And mm. year in and year out, their capacity of closing cases is somewhere between eight and 10,000. So if there's a million cases to close and the locals aren't doing it for the feds, then that gun control basically doesn't exist in practice. So this has been kind of a longstanding tradition. The Supreme Court has even backed it up in now five major Supreme Court cases going all the way back to 1842. It's called the anti-commandeering doctrine. Basically, the federal government, when they try to force locals to do stuff for them, they're like pirates. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're trying to commandeer the ship of uh, the, the states or local governments to do stuff for them. So I'm like, OK, well, this really fits this. So if the water is coming from the Jordan Valley Conservancy District or whatever in Utah, and then it flows through Buff Bluffdale and Bluffdale actually had to positively agree to a contract with the NSA to do this. My attempt has been to have them break the contract because it was made in a false premises on providing security, but just let the contract expire. And then mm. once the contract expires, they can't truck that amount of water in, uh, whether it's 1.7 or 1.2 or even half a million gallons of water a day. They do not have the capacity to do that. It becomes cost prohibitive. So the idea, because I, mean, I was interrupting yourself, so that nope. your, your insight was, yeah, you can't, I can't realistically run in the 10th Amendment Center, ask governors to kick the NSA out or whatever, or certainly they're not going to send the National Guard to Washington to take over the NSA building. But oh. what we can do is say you don't need to sell them water. That, they just make it so logistically yeah. impossible. Don't right. sell them water or in Augusta, Georgia, don't provide them trash or wastewater collection. In the Texas Cryptologic Center, do not provide them the electricity. In the Yakima Listening Point, don't provide them garbage or street cleaning. Just why, why participate I mean, even if it only throws a small roadblock in the way of the empire, me, without my pants on, in my apartment, is throwing a small roadblock mm -hmm. in the way of the empire. And I think if I can do something like that, then other people mm -hmm. can do it as well. Okay, so along those lines, so again, that, so that, that was the favorite one I heard, but what other examples of things like that? have? And, and so how did that work? Did you just... We're not done with this conversation, are oh, we, Bob? Go, go ahead. Is, is there more to it? Like, is that why the yeah, NSA, yeah, yeah. is that why the NSA folded up last year? Yeah, exactly. They're gone. <laughs> They're gone. I mean, <laughs> well, so uh, we started finding people to actually uh, carry the legislation, and it's not just Utah because let's say they they let's say they would pass it in Utah, then uh -huh. wouldn't the NSA just move over to Nevada? or to Wyoming or something like that. So you really want okay. to do this basically everywhere. The most high profile are the places where they already have locations. But we know that the NSA signed that contract with Bluffdale, Utah, in 2011. So they were probably negotiating that before then. So by the time Snowden came, leaks came out, this is 2013, 2014, really by the time the legislation was ready, we're three years late. So we want to actually do this in Missouri and Michigan and everywhere possible so they can't continue expanding. And then we can deal with the more difficult, more high profile ones. So we got, uh, I think it was like 15 states to consider the legislation. We got a lot of mainstream media coverage, very positive. I was mm. on CBS this morning with Nora O'Donnell talking about it. Uh, Mike Meharry, who I work with for a long time, he was in U.S. News probably 10 different times. I, I did interviews with The Guardian, The Associated Press, New York Times, Washington Post. The NSA tried the, a local reporter at the Salt Lake Tribune. I think his name was Nate Carlisle. Also, he just thought this was interesting from an environmental standpoint. Look, Utah water 
rights are a big, big issue in the desert. Mm -hmm. And they're using this much water. And I think he actually reported at one point that the largest local internet provider was doing about 100,000 gallons of water a day at their massive data center. And he was like, whoa, what is going on here? So he started doing all these open records requests and Bluffdale just punted to the NSA. The NSA said national security and he kept fighting and pushing and making, bringing a lot of attention to this. Wired, ARS Technica, Washington Post, The Times, they start covering this water issue. Even We even partnered with Greenpeace and the Electronic Frontier Foundation to fly a blimp over the, the data center in Utah. So again, another weird coalition to bring attention to what was going on there. He eventually got the water records released, and it turns out that they were using much less. The NSA didn't say why. It was still a lot. I forget the numbers. But the assumption was that the facility at that time wasn't fully operational yet. And maybe mm -hmm. the NSA didn't want to say this. So we definitely got a lot of attention on this. And we actually got a bill very much like the one that we had introduced in Utah, signed into law of all people, by all people, by Jerry Brown here in California. And then that was in 2014 or 2015. And then in 2018, a very strong version that actually bans what's called material support or resources. And the language in the bill that I drafted to do this, this Fourth Amendment Protection Act, I actually took language from Section 805 of the Patriot Act. They use something called material support or resources to basically call anybody they want a terrorist. I'm like, well, screw these people. I'll just use their really broad language in a bill to shut off resources to Michigan. The way that I had drafted the legislation for here in California was carried by a guy named Ted Lieu, who's in Congress now. Mm -hmm. I drafted it way too broad, and I think that kind of over, I overstepped. I did it. I was trying to sneak it in in a way where if they passed it in the original form, it would have required the state to turn off electricity to every FBI office in the state. But uh, that was kind of, I overshot. But they, <laughs> it, it's a law that just needs a little follow-up. So we're still working on this. It isn't as high profile as it was in 2014 and 2015. I think a lot of people are very short term in their viewpoints and in their approaches on things. And they just want to work on the issue of the day or they're riled up about one thing or one political party. And then a year or so later, if you don't get it done, you don't get it done. Uh, for me, I really recognize that it's really a long game. I go with kind of the Thomas Jefferson approach and a 1790 letter. He told a friend of his, uh, Reverend Charles Clay, says the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. He basically, par paraphrasing, he basically said, even good people, when you explain to them, they don't know what's good for them. Mm -hmm. So you got to take what you can get and continue pushing on no matter how long it takes. Well, on that quote, though, it's because at the time they were debating whether to use the metric system or the English. And so that's really what what he was doing there. It wasn't oh, a, you weren't even prepped on that. That yeah. was good. <laughs> um, okay. So, well, it, well, that reminds me, too, that what I've noticed with leftists and their causes uh, like I did a lot of work on climate change stuff and, you know, and, yeah. and they would come, you know, they, they try to do cap and trade and then that, that got knocked down and then they come back with a carbon. So it's like, they wouldn't They're give up. Relentless. They would just They're keep relentless. coming back. Yeah. And they would take little gains here and there. And, you know, it, and it just, it's, it was like, you know, someone trying to stop that issue again, whatever people think about climate change were, but you know, it was just, it, it, it seemed like it doesn't matter. We, we can win 17 battles in a row at some point we're going to lose a little bit and it's always we're fighting defensively. And so, yes, yes. And again, ground of liberty be gained by inches means as long as you have the long-term vision, as long as you're just not saying, well, this one little step forward is all we need. That if that, if you're taking that position, you're bas basically validating the state power rather than saying like, look, I'll take this for now. This is an improvement, but this mm -hmm. is the goal. Now, mind you, a lot of people say, oh, this whole you, this water thing, you can't even do this. The fact of the matter, I think, I think what might actually be most interesting and what I haven't done a very good job on explaining to people is it's already happened. It's happened in modern times. Nevada, over a period of about, I would say, 15, 18 years, denied the Department of Energy water permits to uh, to build out completely the Yucca Mountain nuclear waste uh, repository. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say that, uh, you know, it just Obama didn't want to do it. But the fact of the matter is, is that the state legislature actually passed a resolution saying that they oppose this. And then the person who's in charge of water permits, they gave them some temporary ones for building it just for showers and stuff like that, but five times denied water permits. And they were talking about needing, I'm trying to remember, 
Uh, it was like 120, 140 million gallons of water a year. So we're talking not as much as what they were originally thinking for Bluffdale, Utah, but significant. Now, of course, the feds kept pushing uh, and they actually took them to court. And even the federal court, not that I want to rely on the federal court, the federal court sided with Utah They or with Nevada. They said, look, uh, Western state water rights are not to be dismissed just because the federal government wants to store nuclear waste here. So they actually won. And that project is virtually dead. Uh, Trump is still trying to revive it, tr trying to get funding, but no one's doing it. It's just too much of a problem. There are too many roadblocks and they couldn't mm -hmm. get the thing opened. So how, what were the politics then? Like I know in general, like people like having military bases, you know, cause uh -huh. jobs, jobs, jobs. So I would have thought, you know, some places, in other, how can I put it? Is it really that actually Americans really are against the NSA and they're just forcing it down our throat? Or is it that there are a lot of them like, well, we got to stand up to terrorists. And are there some places that would welcome the NSA center? Cause I'll oh, look at, we'll get 15,000 jobs or whatever. Well, Bluffdale still welcomes it, and the, the city manager and the mayor is, like, very excited about it. Uh, but what was interesting, and I think it was Wired Magazine and then also in Washington Post, our second year of actually working on this in Utah, they held an off-session hearing with the whatever legislative committee on doing this. And there were hundreds of people that packed this thing. It was like in August or some September, sometime off year. In Utah, the legislative session is like from January through March. It's a, it's a short session, which is positive. And the thing they said, literally, this is remarkable. All the people that came out there, not one person said, we can't do this. The mm. opposition to it was how to pull it off. And so they were thinking at that point, I think it was late 2015, that in the 2016 legislative session that Utah was going to pass a bill literally to turn off or end the contract between Bluffdale and the NSA. So it was really, really moving forward well. And there was a lot of public support from across the spectrum. And mm. then a colonel from the National Guard visited a, a committee chair in the House Rules Committee in Utah and said, you do not let this bill get out. And that's the end of that story in Utah, at least for now. But we'll, I, I'm long game. We'll keep pushing for this one. I mean, do you know more details about that? I mean, that is the, I mean, I'm sure it was like a 10 minute visit. This is, I mean, well, I mean, how do you know that? I, I'm not trying to, well, I'm not challenging you. The sponsor you, but, of the bill, uh -huh. uh, Mark Roberts told us this, and then we actually published a report and there was no, no opposition to the report. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. and it's hearsay. It's, I don't doubt it. I know for a fact, we also had similar legislation, similar approach called the defend the guard act in West Virginia, which would have required the state of West Virginia to actually ban the use of National Guard troops in foreign wars without a declaration of war from Congress, which hasn't happened since, what, the 1940s. Romania, I think, was the last one at that time. And again, National Guard visited the House Speaker. The House Speaker doesn't deny this. Pat McGeehan, the sponsor of the bill, has said this very publicly. We know this type of thing happens. I mean, we all talk about, like, oh, they'll take money for highway money. But no, I think really what happens is some military guy will come out here and say, well, you're going to be on the BRAC closer li closure list. We're going to close bases. And they just issue threats like that. But at some point, I think people are going to get sick, sick of this. Sooner mm. or later, I mean, we got a lot of education to do. Most people, I don't think, believe in liberty. So maybe some uh, future generation will get mm. sick of it. But I want to set the foundation on how to get things done when we get to that point. So just to finish that train of thought, I mean, just to understand. So it wasn't that the guy thought, you know, you're going to wake up with a horse's head or we're going to kill you in the middle of the night. It, it was, you think they were threatening to withdraw a base or something. Uh, okay. Like that. Because that's something that the, the Pentagon could decide. Yep. They okay. have, it's called, uh, it, I think it's BRAC, base realignment and closure list. The BRAC, they just say that you're going to go on the BRAC list, this spot, this spot, this spot. And there's a, a, a really cool documentary from a very kind of a leftist perspective from years ago called Why We Fight. You see like Chomsky and Chalmers Johnson and people in there. And they talked about kind of the insidious nature of the empire where even like on like the F-35, uh, each part of it is built in a different part of the country. So trying to stop that program means you're going to get opposition from districts everywhere. Right. And I, yeah, I definitely had heard that. Um, and so that, that is interesting. Just to elaborate on that. So the, the F-35 with the, what is that, advanced fighter jet? Yeah. And so 
if they had just had it like being produced in one area, then the people who didn't like, you know, the taxpayers around the world, country would would save the money. And, you know, it was just the, the, the job losses in that one district or something. But by having each component made somewhere else, that just makes a lot more representatives not willing to, to oh, go yeah. against it. OK. Yeah, it's it's a great argument for federalism or decentralization. Centralization, or as the founders called it, consolidation of power in networking terms. If we're talking computing, they would call that a single point of failure. So today, like, you know, we're doing this Skype call. The actual communication is probably bouncing through Prague and China and Brazil. And the reason they do that is because if one system breaks down, it can keep going. And that's the whole idea of federalism as well. When you make a bad choice and you have one person person in charge or one entity in charge, every bad choice impacts everybody. Now, every good choice impacts everybody, but we have to recognize that government doesn't make many good choices ever. Sometimes by accident, it seems mm. like that. But again, it probably costs way more than it should. Uh, so the idea of having a single point of failure. So they don't want a single point of failure on this big boondoggle, this spending project, this F-35, the thing that doesn't even work. The more places they can distribute it in computer terms, it's called a distributed network. So one part breaks down, you still got the rest. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that was just a joke, folks. We're in my studio in L.A. Um, Michael's across, you know, the, the soundproof booth there. Um, High five. Bob. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I do do that. My occasion, I'll, I'll say like. Like with, with Tom, we'll be recording and we'll have an audio clip ready. Like we're going to play Krugman saying something or whatever Trump saying. And I'll say, you got, you guys got it right in the booth there. And uh -huh, there, there are no nice. guys in the booth. <laughs> it's. Okay. So w what other exam, you got any other fun ones you could, that, that are percolating the, you know, some of your babies? Well, I think the defend the guard act is my baby too. Also uh, to me, War is the biggest issue. I uh -huh. started out as an anti-war activist, marching in the streets with the commies and organizing. To me, war is. And then as I got into the whole constitutional thing, I just had my thoughts validated. James Madison at one point basically said, war is the greatest danger to the public liberty because war is the parent of armies. From armies proceed debts and taxes. And in his words, he said, armies, debts, and taxes are the known instruments for the many, putting the many under the domination of the few. I think that's played out pretty much as mm -hmm. he's described it. I yeah. mean, whether you love or hate the guy, but war to me is a big thing. And I think one of the big parts of the warfare start state overseas has been the militarization of police domestically. And when you talk about militarization of police domestically, you're talking about empowering the surveillance state because it's not just the NSA that does spying. It's a lot of local granular things like cell site simulators, license plate readers, red light cameras, drones, facial recognition. This is all operated locally, but it's funded federally and nationally. You also th see things like the drug war. You see things like tanks or bear cats on the streets. Well, that comes from Iraq. Right. So a lot of this stuff is really, really intertwined. And when we look at like the police state, a lot of people, I think in the libertarian community tend to say, well, oh, the great problem is that my local government. Well, yeah, they suck clearly because they're the ones that are beating down doors, but they wouldn't have the size of the manpower they have. They wouldn't have the gear that they use, the spying gear. They wouldn't have uh, you know, the riot gear, the SWAT teams, if it wasn't for the federal government. They have three main programs that fund the local police state. There's the uh, the JAG program. Uh, it's a D Department of Justice, Edward Byrne Justice Assistant Grant Program. There's a Department of Homeland Security Grant Program. We all know what the 1033 program, that's the one that dishes out military hardware. A lot of people think that that's just old warfare gear, which is bad enough. But I think the last report I saw was somewhere between 30 and 4 40 percent of stuff that they hand out to cities is brand spanking new stuff. So they're just dishing this stuff out and it's a real problem. Yeah. And for people, I'll try to find a good link for, for some of this stuff, folks. So again, this is Bob Murphy slash 121. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's you, I've seen funny meme, like ominous memes too, like showing a bunch of guys in SWAT, you know, like like military commando gear and like with a it's not a tank, but a tank looking thing behind it. I guess yeah, the armor personnel carrier. Attract, yeah. uh, and, and it'll vehicle. say something like, oh, and here we see, you know, like government troops in Colombia. Oh, wait, no, that's Phoenix or, you know, something like that. And it, and then you realize like, cause it, and it's a good thing. Like it, it does at first look like, oh yeah, that's, you know, people fighting drug Lords in South America or something. Yeah. And then you realize, no, 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 that's, that's in the United States. It doesn't look like 
what you would have expected the U.S. law enforcement to look like. Yeah, one of the great examples of that, I think it was like Fargo, North Dakota, somewhere, basically they hadn't had an officer killed in the line of duty in 125 years. It's a town, what it wasn't Fargo, but some town in North Dakota, 20,000 people, and they're getting all this tactical SWAT gear from the federal government. Well, why, why? Why does the city of Santa Monica need an $800,000 license plate tracking program or Montgomery County, Texas need a $300,000 surveillance drone like they use in Afghanistan? Well, because it is. These are weapons of war, and the war is not against Islam. The war isn't against Iraq. It's against liberty. So on that issue, how? what's your take? Because I've seen like a spectrum, like some people uh, would say, oh, yeah, it's just, you know, the, the war, it, it was for whatever it was, and then given they had that stuff and it's surplus, and hey, and hey, let's send a little seller here. It's kind of money, and then, you know, the— the cops feel like they're tough guys with all this new fancy hardware and whatever that kind of, versus the other, like the more extreme views, like, Oh no, like part of the rationale for invading the middle East was to know we got to give practice and blah, blah, blah. And then to, mm. you know what I mean? Like, so I've seen, wh where do you fall on that spread? Like how much of this stuff is just momentary people taking advantage of the situation or like long-term plans and people like it's more nefarious even than it seems originally. Well, I mean, <sighs> I think I'm just going to go back to the the James Madison quote and basically recognize that when you have war, a lot of it, you have a military. We're talking about the largest military empire in the history of the globe. You're going to have a lot of bad stuff come out of it. And whether the motivation was to do the war, to have practice, Thomas Paine once said war is the art of conquering at home. And I think that has played out very much so as well. Whatever the motivation is, I think the end result is the same. I lean towards more, uh, there's a lot of warfare. People are very much okay with war. People are afraid of the boogeyman all the time and willing to give up liberty to have uh, send armed people to other countries to kill who they're afraid of. And then well, what happens when they're sitting at rest or whatever, if they ever do? There's a lot of stuff. They're always upgrading equipment. They're going to pass it on. And this is just kind of a nasty outgrowth of that. Uh, if we pivot now to, you know, to the current situation with all this, you know, stuff with the coronavirus, you know, occurring and everything, one of the more ominous things I saw, and, and I didn't go and validate this, maybe you know whether this was true or not, but I've, I saw some headline about, um, like, they're developing drones that can, like, scan people's temperature, like, by, like to see who's out oh. with a fever and that kind of stuff. Is that? Oh, I, that wouldn't surprise me. I mean, mm. they have all kinds of thermal imaging. They have, I mean, the facial recognition technology is incredible. You can equip a drone with weapons. You can equip a drone with facial recognition. You can equip a drone with a cell site simulator that spoofs a cell tower and tricks every phone. It could be 10,000 phones in a given area into connecting to the cell site simulator or a stingray device and passes off seamlessly to the tower. So it first downloads all the data, your location, et cetera. I mean, this stuff can happen and they're not even actually fully, fully implementing the stuff. And then you're not even talking about the really high end stuff that I probably have never even seen really the military level stuff that they're using overseas. And that kind of gets back to what you're saying. Are they doing this to practice or do we just recognize that first what they do to them will happen to us over here? There's an interesting show on Amazon Prime. Um, man, it's a Philip K. Dick anthology. And one of the episodes is basically saying like the others, they're always going after the others, but eventually when you go after the others, they're going to use that power on you. All right. So what, what do you think that like over the next five years, let's say like, what, what are your biggest concerns in terms of like the, the threats to Liberty or, or are you optimistic? You know, that, that kind of, I'm a cynic. Okay. I'm a total cynic. I am not optimistic in my lifetime at all, which is odd because I spend all my time working for liberty with the thought that I'm actually not going to attain the goal for myself. And because you're so, I'm, I'm being serious, like you're so uh, is happy go lucky. The you're a, you're a fun guy. I'll put it. To I'm that excited way. for yeah. this stuff. I mean, I just believe that if I'm going to do whatever I do, I go all in on and. Mm. I really believe in advancing liberty. And if that means I get lucky and get a win while I'm around, that's cool. But if not, if I set the foundation and show people how to do it in the future and they can take the baton and run with it, 
that's awesome too. And I'm really motivated by it. So, well, yeah, no, I'm very cynical. In fact, I think it's probably going to get worse with the amount of spending, uh, the, the debt, the, oh man, the bailouts and the so-called stimulus, the ripoff, the inflation. I think that in and of itself is making things worse and worse and worse. And even if it doesn't create an economic crash, because no one can no one can say when the, the dollar is totally debased or if it'll ever get there because you've got other countries doing the same type of thing. You don't know. But what it does is it creates a further dependency on government. Mm -hmm. And that's a really great way to bring people to their knees uh, is create a dependency. And as long as they believe that government is there taking care of them and protecting them from cradle to grave, that's going to continue to be a bigger and bigger problem. The more it gets involved in things, I think the more that people beg for it. <laughs> Basically, everybody across the political spectrum I see at some point demanding more centralized big government power to protect them. Like William Barr, who the attorney general, I think is one of the worst people on earth when it comes to liberty. He basically set up the precursor to Section 215, the call detail record program for the Patriot Act. He was one of the first guys that created a program for the DEA when he was the attorney general the first time around under Bush to actually tap millions and millions of phones, hardline phones. So this guy's been bad. He's been bad for a long time. He loves civil asset forfeiture. He loves executive war powers. But a lot of people on the right right now are saying, well, I've got this horrible governor here, and I do. I live in California. Gavin Newsom is a monster, but I don't want a bigger monster. I don't want Al Capone to come and protect me from the neighborhood bully. I mean, the neighborhood bully is being funded by Al Capone the whole time. So the mentality, the approach is, is really bad. And until that changes, I think it's going to continue to get worse before it gets better. So I, I, I lost kind of what your, your, your Short argument was. Short version. I, no, I'm no, a cynic. No, no, no. I know I got, I got that, but I'm saying, are you saying some people on the right think that like the Trump administration is going to protect them from their democratic governor? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. We're getting a lot of that actually. Okay. We're getting a lot of calls for that type of thing. And let's say he does. Let's say William Barr actually is no longer the person who is bad on Ruby Ridge or on forfeiture or on war or on surveillance or wants to end encryption or loves uh, or thought the Patriot Act actually didn't go far enough, for example. Uh, let's say all that just is the past and we can forgive people who've done bad things in the past. I've been a monster in my life and I can try my best to continue improving. Uh, let's say all that is the case. Well, the more you hand power to someone to do something good today, the more that someone like AOC or Biden is going to have in the future. And what are they mm -hmm. going to do with that power? That's the same kind of warning that we gave to people on the left when Obama was in power. Like, OK, if you're OK with Obama doing this, what's going to happen when the next guy? But everyone seems to think so short term. And they think, right. well, my team is just going to keep running the show. Well, that just never seems to play out. Maybe some of the people on the left who are talking 10th Amendment and decentralization and federalism now will stick around. But I'm certain that they're going to flip flop again uh, under President Biden or whoever uh -huh. is next. Well, what was interesting, to, I thought, was before the last election um, in, in California, there was a rising secession movement because they were worried Trump would win. And in Texas, there was a rising secession movement because they thought Hillary would win. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm wondering with this, I mean, it's especially with the coronavirus stuff, like the, the, the different coalitions and the way things are breaking down in terms of who wants to maintain the lockdown versus who, who doesn't and just people at each other's throats. And it's, I mean, I, like you're saying, if, 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 and when an economic collapse occurs on top of this, and even we're saying that technically right now, the unemployment rate is, you know, something like 19%, probably. What does shadow stats say? Uh, 200%. I don't, I don't no know, but, uh, the, the dead people can't get jobs. Um, so I mean, it's, it really is like, how, how can I put it? I guess years ago, I was always thinking, oh yeah, at some point, you know, I think secession is the only way here to avoid another civil war. But even then, like, that was kind of hypothetical. Whereas now, like, I really can can see Americans killing each other. Like, because they, they're so, they hate each other so much. And if there's not food, you know, now with the shortages, you know, with toilet paper and blah, blah, blah. Now, you know, they're saying food shortages are going to happen. And, and that's, I've seen it with my own eyes, you know, certain grocery stores. I mean, I think we're starting to see, like, wow, if, if it really did come down to you thought the people who disagree with you politically are the reason your kid is sick or can't eat, you would kill. Of course, like, you're protecting your family yeah, based on see, your belief system. Gavin right. Newsom keeps talking about California as a nation state. And even though he's yeah. horrible, I mean, the rest of the country would be much better if California did leave. Now, I don't I don't necessarily think that might happen. But then again, when I started 
the Tenth Amendment Center dot com WordPress blog. Right. I registered that domain in 2006. I never people would have laughed me out of the room if I said, yeah, in a few years, I'll have, uh, you know, CBS News interview me about turning off water to the NSA. Like, uh, never would that have even right. been a consideration. Right. So uh, who knows how this is going to play out? I think what it's what's incumbent upon us is continue teaching people the value of liberty rather than authority. And Chalmers Johnson, who wrote this uh, blowback trilogy, passed away. This was Ron Paul's kind of foreign policy guy. He was actually a CIA person for uh, the Southeast Pacific, uh, what is it, uh, Vietnam era, that type of area. And he basically said, and I saw him give a speech when Obama was first running for office. And he's like, look, a lot of people think there's going to be a collapse and maybe there will be. And, you know, the amount of money that's being borrowed from China just to keep this empire going, things that can't go on forever don't. But don't beg for a collapse because if you study history, most of the time that what comes out of history is not an improvement, but what right. rises from the ashes is a Mao. Mm hmm. So, yeah, and, and that's partly too dangerous situation. To right. Me. R right. Yeah. I'm certainly in case people misunderstand, I'm certainly not pining for. No, I know. Clashing, you're not either. But, but I'm. It's, that's why I'm what I'm trying to do is like just lay the foundation and say to people like, hey, suppose Texas did want to leave. Would you be cool with that? Could they go or would you say, no, the federal government, if push came to shove, would go bomb I'd them into cool submission? No, no, I mean, I know you would. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like, and, and I actually think yeah, in a more You hang out with two live crew at Hooters. You're, you're, you're pretty neat. <laughs> I think in a more practical manner, and, and Ron Paul talked about this in a speech in Phoenix during the 2012 campaign. He basically said, we're going to have de facto secession and nullification because, you know, like, they just don't, they can't do everything that they do. And we're becoming so polarized. Mm. People are just going to start doing things different. Like the lady in Dallas, Texas, who's like, I'm going to keep, is it Dallas, wherever, somewhere in Texas, I'm going to keep my salon open even though the central government and the local government tell me I'm going to do this. People right. are starting to recognize over time. And I use weed as an example. But in 1995, there were no states that were legalizing something that the federal government prohibits. Now there are 33 states that are actively defying Washington, D.C., which says that cannabis is illegal all the time, no matter what. Mm. And they're doing it. And it is a great example that you don't actually have to have a law repealed. You can when you have enough people say right. no and you have some localities help you out, you're really going to make things change. And on that, is it still the case? I don't know if this is still true, but like th that those uh, dispensaries and whatever, they they couldn't take credit cards because they were or, or banks like you had to pay cash or something. Am I getting mixed up because they were they were worried about the like using the banks yeah. didn't want to Federal, touch them because the, the Fed feds, is yeah. actually the Fed is an enforcement arm of the DEA in many ways. They'll go to a credit union and they've done this in Colorado and say, you need to stop providing these businesses accounts. So the Fed will do this. Mm. And certainly that's been a problem. But we're talking about a multi-billion dollar industry. And I'll tell you, I can get cannabis delivered here in Los Angeles curbside in 30 minutes and pay by credit card. Now, that doesn't happen in every state, mm. but we also have somewhere – uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,500 dispensaries here just in Los Angeles alone. It's more than Starbucks and 7-Eleven combined. It is an essential business as yeah. well, which is fascinating. I, so, yeah, you can do that here yeah. in California. I like that you, you're like uh, Walter from The Big Lebowski. You're like, dude, I can get you a tow by 10 a.m. or whatever he says. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's awesome. True story. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Stay yeah. out of Malibu, Lebowski. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, what I was – Okay. So yeah, what, what I was trying to do, where I was going with the, with the earlier thread though, I was, as I'm trying to just get it out there. Cause most people I would think ahead of time, what am I trying to say? I wanted in the abstract before they thought it was even a thing. And people would laugh at me when I would say stuff like, no, there could be a civil war here. You know, and they look, Oh, come on, Bob, you're being, you know, alarmist. And I, that's why I wanted to just like lay a marker down. Just, you know, hypothetically, suppose people in Texas wanted to leave, would that be okay? And what was funny yeah. is not everyone says yes. I kind of thought I was just going to go through the motions to get them on record. So mm -hmm. then later, and, and again, I don't mean like when I had an interview, I just meant like talking to yeah. people or just like tweeting stuff out to just say, hey, yeah. hypothetically speaking. And and what would, was surprising to me is some people would say no, like, yeah. no, you can't secede. What are you talking about? Like, you know, and so that's, so I'm wondering how you, you think it'll, it might not be formal secession. You just think it'd be more just people flouting, you know, the, the federal rules and whatnot. 
Yeah, I think that's what will lead to it. Who knows what will happen and way down the line in the future. But I, we already see this happening, whether it's uh, 300 immigration sanctuary cities or uh, Newsom saying uh, California is a nation state or the salon owner or marijuana mm. or gun rights sanctuaries or whatever. I mean, it's it's definitely happening in a bigger and bigger way, far beyond when I first started doing this. And I think people are just learning that no matter who's in charge, in D.C., more and more people, you never, you can't rely on them to do what you want, whether it's something that I agree with or not. Mm-hmm. I think if California wants to have a, a socialist health care system, they really, I, I'm not in favor of a government-run health care system. I'm not in favor of government regulations on health care system, but I'm actually an odd advocate of California implementing their own single-payer health system. Because as long as people don't have an outlet to implement their bad ideas, they're going to continue trying take on, taking over the entire national apparatus and force it on anybody, everybody. And you know what? Let's say California or Vermont does it. It's going to be much faster to learn how that actually works. Right. Or right, does exactly. Yeah. It, Cause it's also the, the bad consequences of like people, you know, all rushing to the state to get their free, yeah. you know, like you'd see that. Whereas, you know, the, it, oh, it'd be yeah. harder. You oh, know. I actually even thought of that. It would probably actually accelerate it. So think of all like the, uh, the people from the left in Phoenix, for example, would probably, you'd get a rush over here. Like right. California is going to be a wonderland and bring it down even faster. That's and fascinating. I, I, I don't have it at my fingertips, like exact quotes, but I, I really do think on that exact issue, there was something like, well, we couldn't just give it to anybody moving here because that would just swamp the system. You know what I mean? Like they, they kind of had to have some, so people go, Oh, so are you for immigration or controls? Or it was more, and they didn't mean from abroad. They meant like interstate, like, yeah, we can't just have our thing here because then everybody, you know, who's unemployed across the country would just come here to get their, you know, UBI or whatever. It might've been for UBI. I can't remember, but it was something where it was a nice thing that the people, the advocates wanted at the national level but they realized, oh, if we did it at the state level, you know, we'd have to put some limits in place because otherwise we'd get swamped and it you know, wouldn't work. You know, mm, it'd be wild. too expensive. So maybe it won't play out like that because they might be too smart. Well, but it would, at least it would show, you know, if they put strict limits in place, yep. it, would, it would show they understood the, the problems with it. That it's not just an open-ended, you know, compassion or something like that. Well, so I think in some ways, some people would actually, some people, allies in liberty would actually oppose. They would be like, well, what about the people who like liberty that are, have to be oppressed in California? I'm like, well, mm. we are making it. We all have choices in life. I live in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. It would be my choice to continue here or not. But as long as you prevent, if you use centralized power to prevent it, eventually those people who want that are going to make it a national system. Even Canada, and I haven't studied this enough, but Canada's supposed vaunted system that the left loves that wasn't an immediate national system. I think it started out in Saskatchewan and it was a province by province thing. And it eventually mm-hmm. did, did it over the entire country. And whether you love it or hate it, I don't, I mean, whatever. My instinct tells me it's government run, so it's got to be nasty. Uh, but that that's how it played out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interestingly, I think people don't realize that, I mean, you might, but there's a lot that is done at the provincial level in Canada. That's so I'm not. I know they have the, their national health care, but like like education is more mm-hmm. I think administered at the provincial level there vis a vis the feds than than here. So it's just interesting that people sometimes have a false view of what how Canada works. Okay, well I, I think that's a good spot for us to to catch our breath and, and wind us down. So for people who want to, this is our first break. This is our first break. Uh, exactly right? right. Yeah, we're gonna go ahead and and, and check out and then come back. So. Uh, <laughs> For the people who want to read more about the Tenth Amendment, so like what, what what links should I, should I give and where should they go? I would start everybody out at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash report. Uh-huh. We do a, 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 a somewhat annual 80-page free report that comes in Kindle, PDF, all that stuff. And the first 40 pages stays consistent almost every year. And it basically talks about all the strategies, the legal basis, the constitutional basis, the Supreme Court cases. It talks about resistance to slavery in the 1850s. We got Get William Garrison. We got some Rothbard in there. And then the second half of it shows how we're implementing it on specific issue by issue basis. It's currently up to 2018. We're releasing 2019 and 2020 in the next month or so. So, but the, the first part is really where you learn the most. Okay, great. Th- thanks. So my guest folks has been Michael Bolden. Michael, thanks so much. You rule, Bob. Thanks.